Hi, and welcome back to Unprecedented Journey. I'm Jeff Oppenheim, your host, and I'm glad you're tuning in again for our, well, our literary salon, if you would, our Unprecedented Journey Literary Salon with author Christina Chu. Now, if you tuned in before, you know we were presenting a lot of authors that Christina co-curated for us. So let's join Christina now and learn about the authors we're going to meet. Christina, thanks again for being here in the studio today. Thanks for inviting me. Now, you said you're going to bring some new writers to us, new to us at least. Tell us who they are and who we're going to meet and tell us a little bit about their work. So we're going to hear from four authors. Mm -hmm. um, we have Octavia Ahipi, um, Sergio Troncoso, uh, Matt Johnson, and Mona Washington. Now, we... We ask each of the writers basically the same six questions, six prompts for each of the writers. Uh, they are personal journey. We're asking them to discuss their personal journey with either the book or the current piece that they're working on and are addressing. And also we ask them to look at writer's process, and their process at large, how writers go at it, in case any of us out there want to use this time to start putting pen to paper. Also guidance and inspiration, because that's a very personal thing. Sometimes I think it's probably project driven and other times it may be, you know, as personal as someone in their lives, right? Craft sustainability, which probably will leave them all scratching their heads because I know just even as somebody who works on film, I always get asked, oh, that was a good film. What's next? <laughs> right? <laughs> Can we enjoy it for a while? Also three words of advice. And I think that's really important, too, because too often we don't get included into this literary conversation that happens rather informally, right? So I want to hear from them directly. I want to hear from their ideas of how they can advise us. And we're going to put them on the spot also for a must-have resource or tool, either a book on writing or a tool, or it could even be a good luck charm, some little ritual that they have to rub before they start writing and really focusing in. So we're going to get to hear from all of them. Thank you for putting this together with me and thank you for joining us. I hope you'll stay tuned, watch them all. We're going to break it up by the prompts so each of them will have a chance to answer these prompts. You'll get to be pulled into their literary circle and salon. But here's the thing, I'm going to hold you to this. If you hear of a writer that you particularly like or a book or a subject that they're writing, working on, or maybe all of them, would you please make sure in the comment section here, share a comment, a question, a concern, something with them. We'll make sure they get them. We'll make sure they respond. And even more than that, I'd like you to go out and help discover them just like Christina and I have discovered them today. Go out and pick up the book. But do that by going to your local bookseller. Not on Amazon.com. I'm sorry, Jeff Bezos. But I think we can do better, especially in these economic times, to go to the local bookshop and say, hey, I just discovered a new writer. Could you order up a copy or two or three or four for your bookstore? Think about how that will impact the writers and support them during this time. So I thank you for supporting here, supporting today. You can like, comment, share, and certainly subscribe. I'm Jeff Oppenheim for Unprecedented Journey. Thank you for joining and thank you for staying tuned. Stay well, stay safe, and you know what? Stay well read too. Our first writer that we're going to meet in our digital studio is Sergio Trancoso. He's going to give us a rather timely perspective of how the immigrant's journey influenced the writer's discipline. Let's have a listen. So I grew up uh, in El Paso, uh, Texas, in Isleta, which is a neighborhood on the east side of El Paso. And both my parents were uh, Mexican. Uh, they had just come over from Chihuahua, from Juarez. And so I grew up within a quarter mile from the Mexican border where everyone spoke Spanish. And uh, it was very poor. It was a colonia, which really means a shanty town. We did not have uh, running water. We built our own adobe house. And uh, we even moved into the half-finished house before the windows were in because um, Hoodlums were stealing our copper piping, so we had to move in as we built the house. And my father um, and friends of his uh, built the house as we as we lived there. So uh, that's that's you know my beginning is is really in many ways very typical of uh, atypical of where I ended up. 
which is the Ivy League. So, so for me, that the beginning, first uh, speaking Spanish at home uh, and also being extremely poor, uh, poor enough that of course we qualified for food stamps and, and welfare, but my parents would not accept it because they, they thought it was shameful. So they were very uh, adamant about that. And, and, you know, having to dig an outhouse. I don't know how many writers have, have dug outhouses behind their, their first homes, but that's how we began. And so that culture of doing it yourself, of working to survive, of also living in a Mexican neighborhood, not Mexican-American, not Hispanic, not Latino. It was Mexicano. People had just crossed over last week, last month, last year, and it was in the middle of the desert um, in the outskirts of El Paso. And, and it was a struggle, but it was also an adventure. And I think that's one of the things when you're growing up in that uh, neighborhood that you, you realize that, you know, you had so much independence. You could walk out and go fishing in the canal behind their house. Um, I could walk for miles into cotton fields um, and not be disturbed. And, and everybody was also like me. So that also had an impact on me uh, later in life because uh, when I ended up at Harvard and then went to Yale, as a graduate student. Um, but at Harvard, I remember people telling me, well, you don't act like a minority. Uh, and, I, and I always pondered what that meant. You know, I didn't act sheepish. I didn't act um, like I didn't try to belong, although it was very difficult for me to belong in a place I did not understand. It shocked me that not everyone in the United States was bilingual or uh, understood another language or had grown up um, the way I did. It shocked me that I knew so little about from the first uh, of where, where you go eat. Uh, my parents, for example, did not uh, take me to Harvard. I, I, I went by myself. I had actually never visited the school or the state of Massachusetts before uh, I left El Paso, and so it was from from the very basics of how you get to to, to Cambridge from Logan Airport to uh, what is this university? In fact, I remember when the cab driver uh, was bringing me from Logan to to Cambridge, and that was the first time I had been there. I thought he was kidnapping me. Uh, I, you know, it sometimes happened in Mexico and I thought, and I asked him like, why are you taking me to a park? And he said, no, this is not a park. This is the school. Harvard University is all around us. We're driving into Harvard Yard. And so in my mind as a border kid who grew up in El Paso and Isleta, I never imagined that a university would be so green, would be in the middle of what I considered to be a park. And uh, I didn't imagine that all these buildings around me were the university. So, so that's sort of my beginning and some of the struggles that I had to, to deal with. But, but in, in reality, you know, the, the main issue was this cultural linguistic adjustment to, to places uh, that were so far away in so many ways, not just geographic but uh, in so many ways from where I grew up, uh, I knew poverty. Poverty was always around me and I took it for granted. It had also made you tougher to survive poverty. So I was used to working all the time for my father and his construction projects. And, and I translated that work ethic. That in, um, And I mean, we were working Saturdays and Sundays. I mean, we worked uh, we would get home from school at 3.30, and by 5 o'clock or 4.30, we had to be at my parents' construction project, either at the house or in, in, in things that he would, he would uh, be involved in as a construction engineer. So I learned to work. And then after that, after I got home at 7 or 8 or 9 p.m., I would do my homework. So this 
this day of, of being maybe a 15-hour day routinely was normal for me. And so this work ethic that is uh, so important to, to how I ended up was started by my family and by my father and by my mother who just believed in you work until you drop. You get up and you do it again the next day. And that becomes your pace. It's a relentless, terrific pace of, of focusing your mind and your body to do what other people won't do. And, and that's what they taught me, these Mexican immigrant values that I took to Harvard. So when I got to Harvard and I had no clue, I didn't even know where the cafeteria was. I just followed people to, to see where they ate and, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, the union. This work ethic, you know, taught me to work until the libraries closed at Harvard to work on Saturdays and Sundays when my peers in Hollis Hall, which was my, my dormitory freshman year, uh, when they were partying, I was out at the library working because I was terrified. I was terrified that I would fail. I was terrified that all the sacrifices my parents made for me to get to Harvard, that all those uh, sacrifices would be in vain if I returned um, a failure. So for me, it was, I'd rather drop dead from exhaustion than fail. And, and I also remembered calling uh, my grandmother. My grandmother was a very important figure in my life, probably the most important figure in my early life. Um, she, her name was Doña Dolores Rivero. She was my mother's mother. And she had shot and killed <laughs> two men who attempted to rape her during the Mexican Revolution. And she was this tough as nails woman who lived in El Segundo Barrio in downtown El Paso. And she had grit, she had spunk, she had, I will, ne will not be dominated by anybody. And in her house, she controlled everything, including my grandfather. And if my grandfather did not give her, his money that he earned at the gardener, uh, she would take a broomstick and hit him on the head with it. I mean, she was tough. My parents were scared of her. And she was like, we were not close together. We were simpatico. So I would, I would uh, as a kid, I would drive all the way. Uh, well, I would bike actually about 15 miles from Isleta all the way to downtown El Paso to spend weekends with her and hear these great violent stories about the Mexican Revolution when she was a teenager and how she survived and how she, you know, uh, did in her life um, as a kid there. And, and these, these great violent stories that, of course, any kid would love. But when I was at Harvard and I wanted to quit and I felt out of place and everyone said I had an accent. Um, I called her and I remember that first week I was crying. I said, you know, nobody here speaks Spanish and everyone says I have an accent and I don't feel like I belong. And my grandmother, uh, you know, over the phone said, Sergio, don't come back with your tail between your legs. This is what you wanted. Show them who you are. And so I, I have never forgotten those words. You know, she was um, an inspiration and she was the backbone of our family. And so for me, uh, that really began my effort to fight back. So she didn't know what Harvard was. She didn't know what the Ivy League was. I think she had a third grade education, but she had survival instincts. She knew how to survive in a tough situation because of how she grew up in the Mexican Revolution. So this sense of grit, this sense of toughness, this sense of fighting back, that's what she imparted to me. And so the very first story I ever wrote at the graduate student at Yale was called The Abuelita, which is called The Grandmother. It's about this um, Mexican-American at uh, at Yale calling his, his grandmother, his Mexican grandmother, and arguing about Heidegger's uh, philosophy of being towards death. 
Uh, so I, at that point at Yale, I was heavily into the German philosophers and I, and I learned German to study them. So for me, I was breaking all these barriers, breaking these barriers of what Chicano literature, Mexican-American literature should be. You know, I wanted to see um, the literature of, of my neighborhood, of the border, uh, on the on the page in the libraries at Harvard, and I didn't see a lot of that, uh, and that was my primary motivation to become a writer, to start writing the stories that connected the ideas and concepts I learned at places like Harvard and Yale with the people, the characters, like my grandmother, like my parents, like my brothers and my sister, and people like them in the neighborhoods and characters I would create in my head. That was the primary motivation for me to become a writer, um, to get these stories, the important discussion that occurred in, on the, in these border families, to get them into literature, to get them into the libraries. Thank you, Sergio. Now our next guest is Octavia McBride Ahibi. She's a poet, a teacher, and also a mom. She certainly knows how to nurture poetry, and she's going to tell us about some beautiful poetic butterflies flying by in West Philly. Let's have a look. Unfortunately, at this precise moment, my city is waiting for the imminent arrival of the uh, National Guard. So my sharing with you um, my sort of writer's life and process is sort of being funneled um, through this moment um, that's happening right now, you know, in our, um, in, in our, in our country's uh, history. And it's making me very pensive about the purpose and direction of my own writing, you know, as a poet. Um, so yes, I'm Octavia, as I said. Um, I had the great fortune to have um, self-identified as a writer since I was eight. I'm 58 now. Um, I came of age in a really incredible community in West Philadelphia, uh, the Overbook section, um, especially because of the um, incredible ladies that uh, were my teachers at the um, Overbrook Elementary School. And one woman who was incredibly phenomenal and a uh, zealous lover of poetry was Rose Martin. And she organized these um, in this incredible event, the Black Poetry Pomerama, um, for several years. And what it entailed um, were children from kindergarten to sixth grade um, learning three or four poems throughout the year. And in June, uh, we went to the larger uh, facility, Overbrook High School, and a performance was was had. We presented a performance of um, of the poetry we learned throughout the year. And if you can imagine a community, um, middle class, predominantly African American, um, uh, 250, 300 households, um, learning poetry, preparing children um, to learn poems. So parents were involved, nannies and pop pops, aunties, the mailman just a phenomenal um, infusion of a love of, of words. And um, so that really helped me to, to see myself um, as a writer. I didn't have to wait. Um, traditionally, I can tell high school and even a lot of, even in high school, uh, kids of color aren't exposed to writers who look like them, who have had shared experience like them, or even in college. So I knew early on that they were fabulous people like me, um, who were writers, and I embraced that. Um, I, I, I wanted a writing life, a writing career, um, so I wasn't so much interested in poetry in terms of following the academic track. Um, I was, I was a, a newspaper reporter here in Philly for a number of years, and then I moved um, abroad to uh, to West Africa, settled for a long period of time in Cote d'Ivoire, where I worked at the International Community School of Abidjan. Um, 
so poetry was was mixed in within the within those careers, the right the the careers of journalism and teaching, but um, so I wasn't following the the uh, sort of academic track, if you will. So I didn't have those particular pressures of having to publish um, in certain journals within a certain period of time. I could be relaxed. Um, not to say that that can't happen with that track, but I, um, I could be I can pursue things from a a source of of um, of joy. Um, I was on my own time, so that that has always sort of poetry has always complemented um, my life while I pursued um, other other careers as well. Um, in terms of my um, practice, I've been the caretaker. I was the caretaker of my parents um, up until a few years ago until they passed. And I'm also a mother of two um, uh, college students. One well, my daughter recently uh, graduated from Stanford, and I have a son who is a um, junior here in Philadelphia and uh, a college junior. So my focus was on my family, and but I but it was important important to me. Even though writing wasn't my poetry life wasn't a profession, I had to be faithful to my regime as a writer. And that was writing every day. It's I was never of of the um, ilk that said, "Oh, I have to wait for inspiration." No, you know what? You sit at a your space. Um, whether something comes within that uh, uh, period, you allot it yourself. It may, it may not. But you have to put forth the work, and you have to do it. Um, for me, it has to be done um, daily. So I would work um, early in the morning before. Um, Folks were waking up and, 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 and needing um, um, my energy. Uh, so usually around 5.30, 6.30, um, I love the dawn. I have to work in a special space. I like to be surrounded by plants. And that's a perfect time in the morning. You hear the lovely chirping of the, of the, of the birds. I mean, things are coming alive. So that's inspirational in a sense. I have to have certain lighting, certain music, and my goodies, you know, my special coffee. My little biscuits, and I'm I'm ready to rock and roll. Now, though I may write initially in isolation, my whole creative process is not done in isolation. I'm a person that needs community, and I'm going to tell you wherever I've lived in the world, I made it a point to um, nurture a community of writers who can give me feedback, who I can be inspired by their work. Um, before I present it out to a larger audience. So that's very important to my sort of uh, creative process. Um, what else can I share? It's, it's also very important for me um, to expand um, my, my audience. Though I love when my poetry friends come to listen to me, I don't just want to read for other poets. Um, it is important that I, um, you know, I may read in our, you know, I live in the Penn Drexel area. I love reading in those venues, but I'm in the Irish pubs. You know, I'm in um, the churches. I'm in the schools. I'm living. I'm out on the streets uh, doing National uh, Poetry Month. I love um, creating these incredible um, butterflies where I put my favorite poems on them. I laminate them. I get the most enticing, gorgeous ribbon and uh, attach it to the butterflies. And I tie them to um, the magnolia trees that line my street. And I have a sign inviting uh, people who walk by to take to unravel that string and ribbon and take a poem home with you and devour. So I love um, um, going into spaces of my community. I love hair braiders. I'm always with my African hair braiders and they're reminding me of you know, sharing with me what's happening back home in Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, or Guinea, or Mali, you know. And quite a few times I've had reading, um, poetry readings, and braiding salons, my, and my poems about my time in Cote d'Ivoire, or um, Liberia, and then um, sharing that with my ladies and getting their feedback. It's, it's, that, that, it's that type of genuine organic inter interaction that I'm interested in um, as a poet. Thank you, Octavia. And I love the visual of those butterflies. I'm going to be on the lookout next time I'm visiting Philly. Our next writer, though, is Matt Johnson. 
and he's here to tell us what happens if you give a writer a cookie. Have a listen. To me, the, the writing life is a long haul gesture. It's, it's um, something that it's not sort of just immediate. Um, uh, many years ago, the, a friend of mine, uh, he had a very successful first book. And uh, I was talking to him about his next book. And I was like, are you nervous because your first book was so successful? Do you worry that this next book won't do as well? And what will that mean and all that? And he had a very good response that I've remembered since is that, you know, it's not about a book. It's about, you know, an artistic journey. It's about a larger career. Career sense sort of like, like sort of a job like, but in the sense of a larger artistic journey. So when I'm working, I'm not thinking and putting all of my hopes and all of my ego and ambition into one project. Um, I'm looking at every project as a step on a longer journey. And that takes a lot of pressure off, you know, um, and allows you to just keep going. So on that journey, I do think about individual works as an opportunity to explore you know, this type of writing, an opportunity to explore first person, an opportunity to explore, um, you know, using history within fiction, whatever that challenge is, with the with the larger understanding that it's not just a challenge on the indi individual project, but that it's a challenge um, to uh, grow in the larger sense of your writing life. I do think in order to write long term, at some level, you need to get a cookie. And, and what I mean by that is you need something back from the universe. You know, um, I see this more with poets. Like, you know, poets oftentimes are communicating directly with an audience very quickly. I mean, they're, they'll start in, you know, whatever point they'll write some poems. And within sometimes a couple of weeks, they are in front of a microphone sharing those poems to, to other people or sharing those poems to um, other people within a, you know, a writing group. Um, with prose, it's not the same, um, and particularly with long-form prose. Um, short stories, you can start getting them into journals and things like that that like give you a cookie. And you're like, okay, but it's in this journal, or it's, uh, and it's, it's being read here. But with long-form fiction, it's a lot trickier than that, and usually you're just waiting for a book to come out. And so um, because that, you oftentimes are not getting cookies from the universe until you, you know, get a whole bag of cookies, really. And I think that can be incredibly difficult. And when you look at people who stop writing, it's people who stop being served, um, you know, stop being, getting something from the universe in return for it. And, and those things can be very small. It could just be somebody saying, you know, I read your work, I really connected with it. That's massive. You know, or it could be, you know, big stuff, you know, big publications and prizes and all that stuff. But it has to be something. That you're getting from it. And if you don't get those things from it, whatever that is, um, people tend to stop writing. So um, I, I try to think about uh, this as a long term journey for me that's in part about my own growth as an artist. It gives me purpose. Um, but I also think about it with my with my students, um, trying to put them in a situation where they can get positive feedback and they can get their cookies so that they can join this long-term um, journey as opposed to being one of the many people who will do it for a little while and then will stop because it, because it's too hard and, the, and the, the sacrifice is too much for what they're getting in return. When I get an initial idea, it's just a tiny, tiny glimmer of light um, that shows that there might be something in a direction. It's not like a fleshed out thing. And even when I am in the beginning process and I have an idea about where it's going to go, um, it just still uh, just organically cannot be born in, in an instant. It has to kind of build, you know, on a cellular level, just adding on more and more. So there's been times when I've started uh, from a single sentence. I wrote this novel, Loving Day, and the first sentence was, in the ghetto, there is a mansion and it is my father's house. And I came up with that sentence and I kept saying it to myself over a couple of weeks. And I realized, well, if I keep saying this to myself, it's because something here matters. Uh, something here is connecting. So uh, I started thinking about what that sentence meant and that unraveled um, into an actual novel. Um, but even still, it's just a direction. 
I, I have a strong uh, dedication to um, story and to the power of story and, and to the importance of story as opposed to just uh, scenes that happen. And um, in order to find my way to that, I have to kind of just write in a general direction that I think a book is about. But um, but as I get closer and closer to that direction, the clarity of where I'm going starts to become um, more obvious. So usually I have a general idea of what, what a book is about, but I don't have a hardcore distinct idea about what a, a book is about until um, I'm far enough in that I can see the ending. I can see the direction that's going. And so once I get to that point, um, sometimes I complete it. Sometimes I stop right there if that's two thirds or three quarters of the way in. And then I go back and I start editing the rest of the book to become the book that earns the ending that I can see. And, you know, in that process, that adds even more clarity to that ending. Um, and, you know, by the time I rewrite and get to the ending again, the ending itself has changed, usually not become something different, but more clear. And so it's this continual loop of having the, you know, the beginning, the middle, um, the, the latter parts of the story fit the ending, um, and then having the ending inform the beginning and middle and, and uh, latter parts of the book. So it's, it's this kind of constant loop. So the rough draft might take me a year or a year and a half, um, but the editing will take probably two years at least. Um, it's taken me anywhere from six months up to nine years uh, to edit a, a rough manuscript. Um, and during that time, I'm just, you know, trying to, you know, listen to the work in that sense, I mean, trying to make the work as enjoyable as possible for me and then identifying what I'm finding enjoyable about the work and what I'm not, because if I'm not entertained or amused or interested in parts of the work, the reader isn't going to be. So, um, as I'm continuing, I'm kind of sawing down those parts that are sticking out that don't really match up, even if I love them individually and I'm trying to build up the things with within that story that do and then I just go through that process until basically I start changing sentences back and forth and at that point I just I give it usually to one friend if if you know um, if they have time there's like two or three people in my life that I'll give the books to um, and if they don't I'll just go straight to my agent who's used my early reader and then she bounces it and I have to work on it for another year <laughs> and then eventually it goes to uh, my editor I, he really sees it in the very final stages of it, and yet still has often major things to contribute to it. I'm very fortunate in that regard. Well, thank you to all of our writers, and thank you to Christina Chu, who's also a writer, of course, but she's my co-curator for our first ever Unprecedented Journey Literary Salon. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you'll tune back in because I'm going to be asking the writers some more questions, uh, craft sustainability, for example, and tips they can give us must have resources for the would-be writer in us. So I hope you'll join me for these upcoming episodes. And also remember, if you like these authors, if you like what you heard today, pick up their books, not online, not at a mega retailer, but at your local bookstore. It's a way of helping them out. It's a way of helping the writers out. And also you'll notice I put their websites up. I also will do that in the description column here on the YouTube channel. Be sure to like, comment, share, and hey, subscribe to the channel. That would be great. I'll see you on the next episode. I'm Jeff Oppenheim for Unprecedented Journey. Thanks for joining.